Our scripture reading today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. So follow along as we look at God's word today. Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since you are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another, build up one another, just as you also are doing. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his wonderful word. And I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to that text as we look at it together. According to the Our Daily Bread publication, a number of years ago, the United States Secret Service did an inventory of how they were doing in protecting high, important uh, government officials. And they found one government official who was high ranking that they considered to be least protected of all. So they went to work and they, uh, they installed four glass security doors at his Washington office to the tune of $58,000. Uh, there was also the addition of a pair of huge, thick wooden doors that would be absolutely impossible to break through. Later, when they did an inventory to follow up on what happened with these new measures, they noted that the new security doors were always open and never guarded. So the value of their security uh, went down to zero. And I want us to think about that as we think about uh, this text again today, because I see here a spiritual parallel. The Lord has given us all we need as armor in this world. Everything we need, he's given to us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 speaks of the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. A summary of the things that God has provided for us. For example, we talk about the breastplate of faith. When trouble invades our lives by faith, we can make a choice. We can choose either to believe God and believe what God says, or we can go ahead and choose to believe what we feel uh, might be right, or we can even choose to believe what we imagine may happen in the future. But there's also the breastplate of love, and this refers to the fact that uh, love keeps us from uh, turning inward uh, during difficulty. Uh, the difficulty often comes when we get, our, get out of focus, and if we're focused on love, we're more concerned about others and their needs than we are being self brooding or self-pity. And then it talks about the helmet, which is the hope of salvation. And it's a confident anticipation of uh, one co person called the ultimate rescue, which can keep us from losing our minds as we go through trials, to know that we have this hope of salvation. But we need to remember that these defenses that God has provided for us are not automatic. Uh, God's resources must be used uh, we must put on the armor. Now, before we get into our text today, I want you to notice an interesting thing that Paul is doing here in these verses, particularly 4 through 11, where he's talking about the saved and the second coming of Christ. Believers are delivered from darkness. You are not in darkness, he said in verse 4. That's a negative blessing. Uh, and then he goes on to the positive in verse 5. Uh, believers belong to the light. We are sons of light. We're not just not in darkness. 
we are also in light. And then he reverts back to the negative in verses 6 and 7, that we're not to be as others, as those who are uh, not believers. Uh, we're to be lazy, distracted, or worldly. And then he transitions again back to the positive in verse 8, where he says believers have supernatural blessings that we looked at last time. Believers have been placed in God's light. Uh, they practice self-control. Their faith is in God, the breastplate of faith, and their uh, breastplate of love. The believers are, are those who act loving and believers learn reasons for having hope in God, the helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, I want you to notice that Paul balances the negative and the positive. We're going to see this throughout uh, the message this morning. But we des what we deserve is what we don't get and we don't want. And what we don't deserve, we don't want. All right, did I say that backwards? Uh, what we deserve, uh, we don't get, which is God's wrath. And what we don't deserve is God's grace or mercy, which is what we do deserve. Now, God provides all the supernatural blessings that I've said that a believer will ever need in order to be faithful to Christ. But we must learn to put them on. So I want before we get to the text this morning, I want us to think about how we can put on God's weapons. There are five things that I think will help us a great deal to know how to put it on, just to know that it's there or that God has provided it. Uh, is wonderful, but that's not going to help us until we put these things on. So, number one, we must first be changed by God's power. We must first be changed by God's power. We'll see the results in the other, the last four, but if we miss this one, we miss them all because we have to be changed. The Lord cannot grant his blessings to a person who has not been born again. We cannot put on the armor because we don't have the armor if we're not born again. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, I want us to use this as a kind of a jumping off place to think about the importance of being changed by God's power. If there, Paul writes, for the grace of God has appeared. What does it do? Bringing salvation to all men, instructing, which means training or disciplining us, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, notice the negative, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And there we go to the positive. You see, our love for God's grace that is implanted within a believer binds us with powerful new desires, desires that we want to please the Lord, desires we did not have before God saved us. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ controls us. Sometimes it's translated constrains us. It's like it puts us into constraints. The love of Christ, a love, Christ's love for us, and of course, in turn, our, our love for him. Because you see, when we are changed by God, God implants within a believer a gratefulness for the grace of God that makes us willing to deny ourselves take up our cross daily, and to follow Jesus. Those three things by themselves um, by our, and just in our old natures are impossible. Now in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, which I just read, Paul is saying that grace teaches us or it disciplines us to live right. There is a negative side where we deny our sinful desires. There's a positive side where we <clears throat> our lives display the new life that Jesus has given to us. When we embrace God's grace, it makes negative changes to our life. Uh, it'll drive away ungodliness and worldly desires. By the way, an ungodly person is defined simply as somebody who lives as if they don't need God. If you're ungodly, that means you are living this life without God. And this would include someone who maybe is very nice, uh, someone who does a lot of good things, but sees no real need for God in their everyday lives, unless, of course, something really bad happens. But not only that, but worldly desires. This is the same thing that John talked about in 1 John chapter 2, that's often quoted on the lust of the eyes, the lust, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Said so these are all from the world, worldly desires. Uh, we are either looking to the world for pleasure, and then we all were before we came to Christ, 
or we are looking for the pleasure that we find in being close to God. So the question we should all ask ourselves from time to time is, where do you look for pleasure? Where do you find your satisfaction? It is so easy for us to default back to trying to look for our satisfaction in things of this world. But by God's grace, it produces within us this positive change where we want to look for our pleasure, our satisfaction in God and in God alone. So what will happen? We will live sensibly, righteously, and godly. Uh, being good is not defined by what we don't do, as so many people think, but it also includes what we do do, living sensibly, righteously, godly. Living sensibly means to live with self-control. It makes no sense, by the way, to try to live our lives apart from the one who made everything, including us. But we're also to live righteously, which refers to how we relate to other people. And godly, which means living a Godward or a God-centered life. And that's, of course, the opposite of ungodly. So what does it look like when we have been changed by God's power? Well, there are lots of ways to, to picture it, but let me give you one that's familiar to most of us. And that's Galatians 5, through 24. The fruit of the Spirit the fruit, the, the manifestation that the Spirit is in control is what? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such their things, such, such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, notice, with its passions and desires. So how can we put on God's weapons well, it must start with God changing us. And if you're not interested in God changing you or you think you need no change, uh, the rest of these may be of some interest to you, I don't know, but they will be worthless to you. So let's go on to what else believers can do. Number two, we must rejoice in God's permanent gift of grace. We must rejoice in God's permanent gift gift of grace. The word rejoice is what you need for your outline there. Uh, let me give you a couple of texts that help us to understand why this is important. 1 Peter 1.13 says, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit, talking again about self-control. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, in order for us to put on the armor, part of it means we have to be willing to make God's permanent gift of grace something we rejoice in, not just something we know about. What does that do? Well, it frees us so that we can be alert for the battle that is right in front of us. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5 eight, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Why do we need to be on the alert? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The, the armor that we must put on is partially understanding our need to rejoice in God's permanent gift of grace. Number three, we must expect the soon return of Christ. And expect is the word you need for your outline there. We must expect the soon return of Christ. Paul puts it this way in Romans 13, verse 11. Do this, in the context that talks about loving those who are around you, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. True, of course. The night has almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. We must expect, though, the soon return of Christ. That's what keeps us away from those things. So how often do we remind ourselves that Jesus may come back? How often do we remind ourselves that Jesus may come back today or soon? See, we must expect the soon return of Christ. This is part of what it means to put the armor on. Number four, we must share God's glory with others. The word share is what you need in your outline. We must share God's glory with others. Now, as far as talking about the glory of Christ, I think you would agree it's better to do it clumsily than it is not to do it at all. 
Our marching orders are to spread a knowledge of God, according to the Great Commission. So that leaves us with the option of either obeying or disobeying. Because you see, we fail to share God's glory with others when we don't see Jesus as our supreme value or our supreme treasure. If we really love Jesus and we are in love with him and excited about the fact that he is the one who saved us and is coming back for us, then sharing him will become natural to us. John Piper put it this way, when God gives the radical change of new birth and repentance, Jesus himself becomes our supreme treasure. So when we treasure him and we treasure his glory, then when then the talking about him becomes something we just want to do. It's a part of our everyday experience. Now, it's something very interesting about that helps us in sharing the glory of God with other people. Talking about what God has done to save us was one way of doing it. We learn in the Bible that God is a joyful and a social God. God delights in sharing his joy with us. Read John 17 in the great prayer that Jesus prayed there. Because we are made in the image of God, then as humans, we're like this as well. We may enjoy something, we may laugh at something, but there's something in us that wants us to share that joy with others. Haven't you experienced that? Have you ever found something you're laughing at and something that was funny and then thinking, who, how, who can I share this with? Our joy is not complete until we share it. This is a universal truth, but certainly true for believers. I want you to notice we actually find this clearly taught to us in Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle John says, What we have seen, what we have heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 4, These things we write. Why? So that our joy may be made complete. John is saying all the things we experienced in walking with Jesus and seeing Jesus crucified and risen from the dead and all the wonderful things that we learn from him, our joy is not complete until we share that joy. Many of the Christians in Corinth, on the other hand, lost this focus of spreading the gospel. In order for us to share Christ, we must be careful to follow Paul's advice to the church of Corinth. Because listen to how he rebuked this church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. He says, you need to become sober-minded as you ought, or self-controlled, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. It is always sin that keeps us from sharing the joy of our salvation. So Paul tells the church of Corinth, oh, you just need to stop sinning. If you would stop sinning and make that a priority, you would find a sharing the gospel with those around you who don't know Christ, uh, something that you would begin to do more readily. And I wonder how many people have learned about the one true God because of us. Or could I even make it more personal? I wonder how many people have learned about the one true God because of you. Have you shared? Oh, there's great blessing in sharing. There is a completion to our blessing when we share. And let me give you one more principle that we should be aware of, and that's number five. We must remember that the world is temporary. We must remember that the world is temporary. Temporary is the word you need for your outline. You see, we will never have a passion to display the glory of God to the world around us until we see that everything else is temporary. Peter tells us that since the world is temporary, it keeps us focused on what really is permanent and what is important. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, since all these things are to be destroyed, talking about the world, in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Why? Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will melt with intense heat. Everything we see in this world is temporary. The only thing that's permanent 
is our relationship with Christ and our eternal souls. By the way, the last four letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, has a re they all, the last four all have a reverence to the eminent return of Christ. So I wonder what it might do to a church's behavior if this truth began to dominate our thinking. If we saw everything in this world as temporary and the only permanent thing we can latch on to is God himself. Now I want us to get into the text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses, look at verses 9, 10, and 11. Because these help us to get the, the full picture of what it means to follow Christ and to understand our need for him. Look at verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, e, in your outline, believers are free from eternal punishment. Now here we come back again to a negative blessing. This is something we deserve we don't get. We are not destined for wrath. Paul is coming back to the same thought he started in verses 3 and 4. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you like a thief. We should never forget as Christians not only what Jesus has saved us for, but what Jesus has saved us from. Spurgeon talks about the wrath of God and reminds us that the wrath of God does not end with death. This is a truth which the preacher cannot mention without trembling, nor wondering why he does not tremble more. The eternity of punishment is a thought which crushes the heart. You may have buried the man's body, but you've not buried his sins. His sins live on and are immortal." End quote. So you see, yes, our souls are eternal, but if our souls have not been washed clean by the blood of Christ, our sin is also eternal. John Bunyan said, one leak will sink a ship and one sin will destroy a sinner. You see, we talk about the wrath of God, it all but all it takes is one sin to stir up the wrath of God. The word wrath represents God's settled indignation and controlled Someone called it passionate, hostile feelings towards sin. Settled indignation means that God's holiness cannot and will not coexist with sin whatsoever in any form. One leak will sink a ship. One sin will destroy a sinner. Yes, that's all it takes because we have to be, as the Bible says, holy. Now, most people think they're basically good people, and why is that? Well, it's because they're comparing themselves with others who they think are probably worse than them. But let's remind ourselves, God does not grade on the curve. The only holiness that God accepts is his own. Peter quotes uh, uh, the Old Testament in 1 Peter 4, 16, where he says, where it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy, God says. You see, the only holiness that God is okay with is his own. So believers are free from eternal punishment. But the last three here I want you to notice are positive, and I'm so glad. And this should encourage our hearts. Look again at verse 9. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Point F in your outline. Believers possess salvation through Jesus alone, through Jesus obtaining salvation, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what a blessing. Yes, it all it takes is one sin to incur the wrath of God. But then again, all it takes is the blood of Christ to wash all sin away. You see, God's purpose for his followers is not wrath, is not the wrath that's going to come on the on the earth at the day of the Lord when he returns. But God's purpose for believers is that they would have salvation when he comes back, complete salvation. The only source of salvation, of course, it says is through or by the means of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our option for forgiveness, but Jesus is also our only option for forgiveness. You see, this freedom from the punishment of our sin and the possession 
of our salvation changes us. And the last two points I want you to notice it changes us in two ways. Verse 10, he died who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. And I want you to notice for your outline G there, believers long for Christ. We will be or live together with him. This is an important principle that we need to remind ourselves frequently. What's important is Jesus and being with him. Paul says it this way in Romans 14, 8 and 9. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Aren't you glad? For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and also of the living. Notice the the statement in your outline there, the benefit we receive from the cross is our forgiveness. No argument there. The greatest benefit we receive from forgiveness is to be with Jesus. Do you see that? It's all about Christ. It's all about being with him. It's all about having the opportunity to be in his presence. You see, Jesus is the one who has provided and paid for everything. When we repent and trust in Christ, we have an eternal prepaid vacation that is filled with ever-increasing and unending joy. That's why Paul puts it this way, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. He says, you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God to wait for his son. Why did you come to Christ? What's the result of giving our hearts to Christ? The result is that we want to wait for his son, or Jesus, whom from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So the question for all of us to ponder is, are we truly waiting, longing for Jesus to be with him, to be in his presence? Paul puts it this way in 2 Timothy 4, 8, there's laid up for us a future hope. And he said, the Lord will give me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all, listen, to all who have longed for his appearing. If you are a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you long to be with him. You have this longing deep down in your heart to be in his presence. So you see, when we are freed from the punishment of sin and we possess eternal salvation, it changes us so that we long for Christ. But not only that, H in your outline, look at verse 11. Therefore, here's the conclusion, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. H, believers support each other. We long for Christ. We have that upward longing, but we also have an outward longing. We long to support, encourage, or to comfort, or to build one another up. We're commanded to encourage, and we're commanded to build each other up. This is not an option, but it is something that true believers really want to do. If what we say to each other does not encourage or does not strengthen one another, let's just not say anything until we can find words that will encourage and strengthen each other. Someone said there are two types of people in the world. Those who come into a room and say, here I am, and others who come into a room and say, oh, there you are. There's a difference of focus. The scripture tells us that we are to give preference to one another. We are to edify one another, to care for one another. We are to serve one another. On one another's burdens we are to bear. We are to forgive one another, comfort one another. And of course, we are to pray for one another. This is all part of what happens when we are miraculously transformed by the power and the grace of God. Not just to save us from the wrath of God, but to change us and to make us people who love Jesus and want to be a blessing and an encouragement to others who do. Now, let me just make a comment here before we finish. Since Paul commanded us to encourage one another, uh, 
we can assume a couple of things. This is not in your outline, but we can assume that we all need encouragement. When we interact with each other, and I know it's mostly by electronic means right now, but when we interact with each other, let's just assume that everybody we talk to needs comfort or needs encouragement. Malachi 3.16, a fascinating little verse, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. If we fear the Lord and have a love for him, it should be something that we, we are then doing where we want to reach out and, and speak to each other, to encourage each other. We all need encouragement. We're all in this battle together. But let me also make another implication from this, and that is that encouraging each other is also a process. Romans 14, 19, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. We pursue these things. It's not a once and done deal. Or 1 John 3, 3, everyone has his hope fixed on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. It is a process. So how can we do that? Let me give you a couple of suggestions, three suggestions. How can Christians encourage and build up each other? Well, we can pray with and for each other. That's one of the primary ways we encourage each other. In order to be good at encouraging other believers, it just makes sense that we first of all need to get to know them to some degree. How can we pray for a person we don't know what they're struggling with or how we can pray for them? So one of the best ways we can encourage each other is to spend time praying together. Right now we're doing that electronically. Soon, by God's grace, we will do it physically together again like we have for so many years. But this is vital, it's important. It's not just the, the icing on the cake as I see it for the Christian life, it's, it's the cake itself. We need this. Here's another suggestion, that is to study the scripture with each other. And we have that opportunity, not while I preach, but we have that opportunity in the Bible training hour we have that opportunity on Wednesday nights. We have that opportunity when we get together and study the word in shepherd groups. We can study the scripture with each other. Oh, what an encouragement that brings to our hearts. Now we should communicate our knowledge and our experiences to one another and to make sure we do it with humility. So we should join in prayer and praise with another. We should, get a, we should be setting a good example before each other by studying the scripture with each other. And number three, also we need to be reminding each other that the Lord is coming. And that's really what this text does in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It reminds us that the Lord is coming. If you have your Bible, you still have your Bibles open, back up to a couple of verses in chapter 4. He says in verse 17 and 18, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with, the with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I love the emphasis here. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back, I think, with clouds of multitudes of believers and angels, probably thousands upon thousands upon thousands. I think I mentioned this last time, but what a joy it is to know that it's the Lord that we will see and is the one that we will focus on. And so then he says, we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation, referencing, uh, without reference, to sin, to those, listen now, who is he coming for? To those who eagerly await him. So how eager are you to see Jesus? No matter what trials you may be going through, Psalm 30 verse 5 reminds us weeping may last for the night, but a shot of joy comes in the morning. You see, we need to encourage each other and build each other up, and I am convinced that if God has really transformed your heart, this is something that resonates with you and it resonates with me. Not that we don't need constant reminders to do this because we get distracted so easily, do we not? But we can encourage each other and comfort one another with this wonderful truth that Jesus is coming back. And when he is, he will make everything wrong 
right. And he will exalt himself and take his place, his rightful place as the king and judge of his own creation. Now, one last thought, and I want you to notice how Paul ends this section. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Just as you also are doing. The church of Thessalonica was a good church. They needed reminding, they needed encouragement, they needed some instruction, but they were doing the right thing. And as I meditated on this, I wanna tell you, I'm convinced that if Paul were to write a letter to Bethel Chapel Church, he would say the same thing. Oh, what a thrill it is to know that we are doing this, that we are encouraging one another, building one another up. Now, we have a lot way to, to go, and we need to grow, we need to be better. But I'm so grateful that God has brought together a group of people here at Bethel who love each other, encourage one another so much uh, for the, I mean, for the most part. So let me just end with this quote from John Piper, because here's the crux of everything we've been talking about. Sin is what you do when your heart is not satisfied with God. And we could substitute some other words in there. Sin is what you do when your heart is not thrilled with God. Sin is what you do when your heart is not expecting the presence of God. Oh, may that be the case in my life and in yours as we think about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's have a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope that lays before us. There are many things that are difficult and hard, and I know every person listening to me right now has a struggle or struggles. We need you, we need your encouragement. We need the encouragement of other believers. So Lord, I pray that this would, that this knowledge of your second coming and this reminder that you could come at any moment, at any time. This could be our last week of doing these uh, worship services over the internet. Wouldn't that be awesome? If Jesus would split the skies and come home and come back to this world and take us home to himself, if he would do it today or tomorrow. We don't know when you're coming, Lord, but in the meantime, we want to be faithful. Help us, Lord, to do the things that bring you glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We started the custom of closing our services online um, by singing the doxology as a way to praise the Lord and point our hearts towards him. Um, it's a song that has been being sung throughout church history and um, it's a song that we are singing separately and we're looking forward for the time when we'll get to sing it together right here in this room. So you sing it along with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a good week, brothers and sisters.